edge-show.com. Edge-show.com. The hyphen is stupid. Edge-show.com. You're listening to The Edge with Mark Thompson. Hi, and welcome. Two conversations in this episode, the first of which relates to the biggest star on television, self-immolating. What Roseanne Barr did was more than just tank her television show, which was the most popular show on television. She destroyed the businesses and lives of so many people working on that show. This is more than a television story. It's really a story about how someone gets so far out over their skis and their own crazy begins to invade to the point that they just can't shut up. And this high wire act that a network was doing by hiring her to begin with ultimately ends with them falling all the way without a net and they cancel Roseanne's show. And then you'll hear in this conversation all the other damage done. It's a very big story as we sit here on this show, kind of show business adjacent. We try to give you perspectives from time to time from those who report on this world of show business. And today, Sam Rubin joins us with a complete summary of the circumstance that both led to and now follows Roseanne Barr's problems. Sam's with us for just the first 15 minutes of the show. Then we welcome in Michael Shore. I want to talk about two Supreme Court rulings, one of which you may have noticed in a big way because it got a lot of play, and that was the legalized gambling that's going state by state. And what I think is going to happen is these gambling parlors are going to end up being everywhere like they are in Britain. But we'll talk about that with Michael Shore. What might surprise you is that Michael Shore and myself are both gamblers and we, that that shouldn't surprise you that we're both gamblers but we don't support the legalization of gambling state to state we actually think that this supreme court decision to legalize it is a bad thing and we'll give you those reasons in this episode the other supreme court decision is about workers rights and it's a very important decision and it's an outrageous decision and it's one more way that america is becoming just another country ruled by the richest and most powerful corporations and i'm sorry to say that america is really cementing its place as an oligarchy. But I'm not going to get, I know there I know there are Trumpies out there. This is not a Trump thing. I don't think we even mention Trump in this show, aside from the times I just mentioned him now in saying I'm not going to mention him. So Trumpies, please don't get angry. Oh, I just lied. Wait a minute. Michael Shore made a prediction on this show, I want to say about a month ago, and I do mention Trump, and it's about Trump. So it is related to Trump. So I lied. There is some Trump, but you can skip past it, Trumpies, if you just can't take it. We talked to Michael for about a half hour. I had a guest on this show also who just didn't make it. So I'm glad to have Sam and I'm glad to have Michael. And I think it's a nice tight show for you to enjoy wherever you're listening, maybe on your drive, whatever you're doing. You can enjoy it, and then you can it, – it runs a little less than an hour, this show. So I got one email from Aaron. Aaron wrote, the Yulin Dog Meat Festival is underway in China, during which they skin – dogs and cats. I'm going to spare that she kind of gives me a line or two about what it is and the Yulin Meat Festival, Dog and Cat Meat Festival we talked about on the show before, which is really the reason I'm mentioning this. She says, I know you're an animal rights person. Please do a show on this. Aaron, we did a show on this and I want you to check it out because it was with Mark Ching, who actually goes back to China and the Asian countries and gets many of the animals that are earmarked for slaughter. But of course, there are many, many more than he can possibly take back, but was successful in closing down a couple of the illegal slaughterhouses. And he's working on getting legislation passed here in this country, because in this country, believe it or not, you can slaughter any animal you want. Absolutely. You could you could slaughter your dog and, and eat it. There's no in, I shouldn't say not in every state, in, I want to say, 42 states, something like that. You have to go back and listen to the show and we discuss it. Anyway, if you want to find that show, just go to the website edge-show.com or even on iTunes or YouTube. You can find it again you can look for Yulin Dog Meat Festival. If you're on our website, obviously, just look for Mark Ching. He spells it with it's a C, M-A-R-C, Ching, C-H-I-N-G. So we did that show, Aaron. Please go find it because I think you'll learn a lot, and it's a very emotional show. So, Aaron, thanks for your email. Again, our email address is edgewithmarkthompson at gmail.com. You know the ways you can support the show. I'm not even going to go through them all. Thank you for subscribing on YouTube, iTunes. Thank you for sending stuff on PayPal. Thank you for shopping through the Amazon link on our website at edge-show.com. Thank you for being here. Let's get started. 
This is the edge. The advantage, it means. They look like to spit on me for no reason. That's horrible. Is there some comfort in uncertainty, do you think? You're a degenerate. Because Australian shepherds need action. Wow. Yeah. This is the edge. That's a self-loathing term that I use. For oh, got it. This is The Edge. Welcome, Sam Rubin from the KTLA Morning News, the number one morning show in Los Angeles. And more to the point, you're an entertainment reporter who's able to work that fluffy stuff, but I think a lot of your stuff is quite substantial. I, you're appreciated, and, and this sounds like puffery, but it's not, worldwide. I mean, I know you report BBC calls you, and you'll be doing stuff in Australia and, and other English-speaking outlets. And so I want you to put your more serious hat on for the story that involves Roseanne. So welcome, Sam. Now that the welcome, it's a brief one. I wish I had a, a you know, but, but... Brass band, that's all right. Yeah, exactly. Not I, to worry. I, right now, I want to drop you right in. Please. It's a big controversy. This was the number one show on television that Roseanne had. The whole thing is absolutely extraordinary. And when it took place on this one incredibly busy day, and it's a phrase that people use, and I think to a degree overuse, but to experience it in real time, the exposure of the tweet around 7.30 local time, and three hours later, I guess the tweet had been alive for about seven hours, but essentially the number one star in American television, loses everything, and then, by the way, in the last 24 hours, has almost effectively been erased entirely, another extraordinary thing. And all because of one tweet, we're learning now there's more behind it. But it, I, I've never seen anyone fall so far so fast, and it was almost startling and, and disconcerting to me, because it, it, you know we carry these phones in our pockets, and uh, there for the grace of God. I mean, it, it was one you of those things. You do feel as though it was, but, but it was more than just a single misstep, as you say. We'll get, we'll get back to that in a second. First, the damage that you mentioned, the erasing. So ABC comes out and announces, we're going to cancel this show. Uh, and that was, a, that was a gutsy move, some would say. On the other hand, uh, I always feel as though these companies exist with minimal ethical compass, there has to be a commercial concern here. Well, I, I think what we have seen uh, very recently, and somebody made a fantastic point that if a company loses 5% of their business, that's their entire profit. So the big concern here was, all right, we stay with Roseanne, we stick it out, here comes advertiser boycotts, here come particular viewership community boycotts, uh, and, and then what happens? So do we cut off our arm now or slowly bleed out later? And you get no credit for cutting it off later because you cancel that show in view of boycotts and blowback and you're not doing it for the right reason. Precisely. And, and so I, I think in that way, while I was still utterly floored and stunned, I think first and foremost by the tweet, but then by the subsequent super fans cancellation some would suggest well gee what else what, what else could they possibly have done but it seems that they acted so quickly it was without regard to commercial consequence which as we both know never happens in no. american entertainment or american television so that was pretty extraordinary and then the other thing you think about all right it's her and she's done but a, a television show is like a small community so here are approximately 200 people whose livelihoods, generally good union-backed livelihoods, vanish. And the thing that really struck me in a personal way, and I don't know, Mark, if you're the same way, but I suspect that you are. If you or I, just fortunately enough, uh, as either writers or performers or grips, had gotten a job on that show, after the first two or three episodes with those enormous ratings, I would have gone out and bought the house based on my five years that I was going to get being on the show. Sure, projected earnings yes, almost. I, because it's all, you know, what could go wrong? Right. And so that is yeah. is really, really uh, quite surprising. So that that's, you know, really a shock. It's also worth noting that there are other aspects of this show, like the original Roseanne that lived on in syndication. Well, this, this was part of the immediate erasure and what I think is so interesting and what I think Roseanne herself is still struggling to comprehend. Uh, and I will equate it to somebody with different sins, but this Harvey Weinstein-esque toxicity, immediately. And suddenly, she's kryptonite. I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, I actually had a funny circumstance yesterday because there is a global interest in this. And I was sitting in a green room in West Los Angeles about to do a report to Australia, sitting with Rob Reiner, who was doing a big thing for MSNBC. And Rob Reiner had a very good line. He said, when we were doing All in the Family, 
we were making fun of Archie Bunker. Today we discovered that Roseanne is Archie Bunker and that there's a big distinction between the two. Yeah, because that's a was one of the things that was talked about sort of in all of this is look at how they're overreacting to this, why all of the family used to do this kind of thing. And you're right, the way all of the family cast it was completely different, meaning I don't mean cast it in terms of the casting of the characters. I mean the way it was played out. They made fun of the bigot. They right. didn't They didn't use bigoted language and let it go by. So it sounds to me like you're saying in the case of ABC, just to tie that loose end up, it really was in a way then a principled move that was punctuated Punctuated by a commercial concern. I, I have to think that somebody, as they were discussing this, you know, we need to cancel this show, that Bob from accounting or from advertising sales got on the phone or walked into an office and said, by the way, we sold our entire fall schedule predicated on Roseanne. We told advertisers, you can buy Roseanne, but you have to buy these five other shows you don't want. So some have pegged the number at 60 million. Tom Arnold, who probably is not in a position to know, says it's hundreds of millions but there is a massive initial loss. When you call up uh, M&Ms and you call up Ford and you call up all these people and say, oh, by the way, oops, the show you bought, that's not going to happen. So we will give you your money back or we'll reallocate it in some other fashion. But I mean, you know, how we don't know this. It's impossible to have a hit. ABC hasn't had a hit of that magnitude for years. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, this is a family show. And honestly... I never saw the new version. I saw bits of it. But I liked the fact that they disagreed on politics, and it seemed like there was a lot of funny the, stuff the going on. The new version was very funny, was terrific. Roseanne, very good in it. The supporting cast, extraordinarily good in it. And my family and I, and probably you could limit this to one or two other titles, watched faithfully every Tuesday night, waited for it to come on and all watched together as a family and really laughed at it. And then on our television show in Los Angeles, we would play clips the next day and they just, they played because they were real and they were funny. And it's, you know, like that, that notion of a comfortable shoe or something. You just, I mean, John Goodman, so you're, you're, you're very comfortable watching that show or we all were. Yeah. Now it's different. You know, I said something on the radio here in LA and I'm curious whether you agree. And it sounds to me like everything you said implies that you would. And that is, you know, I know she's going to do a, a podcast and she's going to come forward in different ways. She's trying <laughs> the to... only winner in this is Joe Rogan's podcast, right? She's doing Joe Rogan's podcast. Exactly. Uh, and she's tweeted stuff about how she was on Ambien. And, and in other words, she's tried to introduce some doubt into whether or not well, well, she's... Well, I think, which is really interesting, and I, I'm only an amateur psychologist. I don't know what was going on the night of the initial tweet, although she was having a fight with Chelsea Clinton and uh, the George Soros thing, which, you know, unspeakably anti-Semitic. So the she whole said that George Soros had essentially turned over Jewish families during the Holocaust. No, to, just for, just for awful, America. awful stuff. Right. So in any event, the horrible tweet storm, her apology, then she's off of Twitter for most of the day, and then overnight on a Tuesday night into Wednesday, and I think she's lying in bed at her home in Hawaii or elsewhere, realizing the totality of what she's lost, and then I can't keep track of the number. More than 100 retweets and original tweets, she tweeted the entire night, and that, to me, is is almost manic behavior. Yeah, yeah. And then the the, the it's desperation. It, as well. It's just great. And and then a, a tweet this afternoon. You know, boy, thanks for all your support. I'm going to see you know my options. Well, and that I, won't I, take long. And I tweeted. I should have tweeted that. I said, what options? Right. Um, so I I think she's in for a rude awakening. And you know, it's not dissimilar to Harvey Weinstein in this respect, where he coined that phrase. Uh, mo uh, I, I only uh, there, there's a a moment. I'm toxic for the moment. Mm. No, no, you're toxic forever. I mean, it's there is it, and this brings me to what I was going to say. I said on the radio in L.A., you just can't walk this back. You certainly can't walk it back the same week. You no, know? you can't walk it back the same week. And then, of course, the the only example I can think of, ten years later, you know, after banishment from Hollywood. Mel Gibson returns to walk the Oscar red carpet. Right. So that's the best resurrection that I can think of. Yeah. It's sort of the only resurrection I can think of. And he has the beads far more than she has. He financed his own movies and right. that Hacksaw Ridge kind of brought him back. Here's the thing, Roseanne, I don't, I don't know. I'm not her accountant. She doesn't want to fund a brand new sitcom starring Roseanne. That's going to cost millions of dollars. Right. So I, I, th it, it's, it's so interesting. But uh, Tom Arnold, amongst others, and again, Tom Arnold, you know, with a 25-year perspective from the past, 
is like she wanted to do herself in. Well, you know, somebody else said that to me, but I, I don't buy it. And just for all the reasons we've said here, which are associated with shame and with being such an outcast, to be so ostracized from this community of Hollywood. You may think Hollywood's BS. You may not be into your show. It may not have turned out the way you want. But you don't leave in shame because you have then no options. Look, Dave Chappelle pushed away from his show, but he didn't say, hey, I'm tired of working right. for the effing white man. Yeah. And Bobby, he didn't. I mean, he just left. And, uh, and now has come back triumphantly. And then the one other thing that I think is difficult for, for you know, the average person to appreciate, but we'll paint this picture, just two weeks ago, the single most important day in ABC's year, a huge presentation to advertisers in New York, it's referenced as the upfronts. These are like stage show productions. So all the advertisers in the, in the audience, curtain is drawn, curtain opens, there's a spotlight. Who's the first person they see? Not the president of ABC, not some hired singer. The first person they see is Roseanne Barr. And then Roseanne Barr sings my way. And the president of ABC comes out, gives her a huge bear hug. Our Roseanne, she's always done it her way. Well, little did he know a fortnight later, uh, she would do it her way and do herself in. It's amazing. Wow. But, you know, what happens, and maybe it's part of the pathology here. You know, these are the people who are writing the checks. These are the people who finance the entertainment business. And sure. they are the cheering, the, 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 you know, the, oh my God, Roseanne is the savior of broadcast TV. She could not be more celebrated. Right. And then, you know, what, what, what does that whipsaw just do to your head? It's, you know, it's all gone. The, the, uh, here in Los Angeles on the weekend, a scheduled uh, for your consideration Emmy event because Roseanne and her cast were campaigning for Emmys. They've erased her completely in less than a day, except for the bus boards that are still driving around. Oh, sure. Saying for your consideration or consider TV's number one comedy. Wow. What a fall from grace. Unbelievable. So the political side of this, you know, Trump commenting on it and Drudge commenting but, but, on but, it. You know, Trump's comment, and, and this is just, a, you know, another notch in the uh, horror belt. It was all, As you know, it was all about him and a real opportunity to say something of significance, to condemn her remarks. He does none of that. Yeah. <laughs> that I was really shocked. Uh, Nicole Wallace said something which I thought was very funny. She said she read that tweet three times because she literally couldn't believe it. Yeah, and, and what Sam's referring to is this tweet. Uh, Bob Iger of ABC called Valerie Jarrett to let her know that ABC does not tolerate comments like those made by Roseanne Barr. Gee, he never called President Donald J. Trump to apologize for the horrible, in caps, statements made and said about me on ABC. Maybe I just didn't get the call? I, like, what's that even about? I don't even know. It's, it, you know, the next time something great or... Well, he always makes it about himself. Yeah. But he put the me in Memorial Day. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Just terrible. Yeah. I think that's everything, right? I really just want to get a sense from you, but I think we've hit it. I mean, she said something so incendiary, there's no walking it back. I think you've detailed well the fact that she's been erased. Her talent agency dropped her also. Uh, uh, yeah, that's the part that's so extraordinary to me. The show ran in America on three separate cable networks. Immediately, all announced, no, we're not running it anymore. And I'm sure uh, on some of these cable channels, it was the highest rated thing they were running. You know, And, and, and again, the, the shame of it... You just hate to see people, you know, erase and trash other people's careers, which is what she's done. Right. There is a whisper. I would find, I'd be very hard-pressed to find this happening. But apparently, contractually, they've got to pay John Goodman all these people. And there is some thought, well, they're here and they're on the payroll. Do we do the Bonners? Do we do something, uh, you know, Roseanne without Roseanne? I don't, that's, that's a tough nut, but it'd be interesting. It would be awkward and probably get a lot of tune-in on episode right. one. But if it's bad, what do you do? Yeah, I mean, as you say, you've got them there anyway. Maybe, yeah. maybe you, uh, let's just... One last thing. Five years from now, it's all cooled out. What happens in five years if she tries anything? It, it, I'll tell you that what. We, we showed a cover from the late 80s of the TV Guide, which featured Bill Cosby and Roseanne Barr. Roseanne says, I'm number two now, but I'll be number one soon. Five years from now, we are not going to see a revival of The Cosby Show, nor, as you and I are speaking right now, I can't imagine what Roseanne could do to possibly resurrect herself to the level she was at before this tweet. And then the other thing that I think is going to get more exploration in just the next couple of days, ABC being applauded and lauded for all this, but these tweets have gone on the whole time. Right. So you know what you were doing, you know who she was when you hired her, and you sort of, this is a phrase that's been used all day, but you held your nose in the hopes that it kind of, so they were naive in doing that, and or, which is the same thing said about the president, there's nobody in the world you could get to take her phone away. 
Right. You know. Right. So. She was a conspiracy theorist, and it's argued anti-Semitic and all of these other. I mean, these are really fringe thoughts, right. and I, I guess some other people have them. But you know, you would think as a rational, reasonable person who possibly has them. But the Valerie Jarrett thing was just just mean and stupid yeah, and, and not was, funny. Again, she's getting what she deserves yeah. on that. And then may, maybe another slight analogy is uh, Kathy Griffin, who I think has scratched and clawed her way back to some economic redemption because she can sell out theaters around the country and around the world. I don't think Roseanne is that kind of stand-up. I don't think Roseanne has the need that Kathy Griffin had. Um, yeah, Kathy Griffin was a real creature of stand-up. Right. I mean, and she, that was, she always defaulted to her stand-up. Yeah. All right. I, I love that you came by. Thank you very much. And let's do a happier... Uh, uh, Tom, you know. the, the Edge is my jam. Uh, okay. Happy to be here. You know, when they do Frozen 3 or right. whatever it is, <laughs> Look, I'll, be, I'll be right here. Right. Very good, Mark. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Subscribe to The Edge with Mark Thompson on iTunes or on Stitcher. With a guest postponing, this may be the only thing on this show. I think that's exciting. I mean, it's exciting for the listeners. <laughs> Don't want to put too much pressure on you, but I'm just, I wanted to get that out of the way. That's fine. I, I feel no pressure. Here's, here's something, Mark. I think when I hear a guest canceling on other shows, all I want to know is who the guest was. And you're not going to call that person out probably and say they canceled or they didn't show or, or whatever. I mean, life happens. Yeah. I, but I want to know. And I'm speaking for every listener because that's the... The things that people don't have access to are the things they want to know about. Maybe it's just me because I'm, you know, I'm curious. I'm a reporter. I always want to know what's going. I want to know what the manager's saying to the pitcher on the mound. I want to know, you know, I want to know what the guy who just singled is saying to the first baseman on the other team. You sure, know, sure. I agree. In fact, I agree so much that I have a rule when somebody in any forum. Certainly, people have heard me do it here, and I do it on the radio. Yeah, and people will tell a story and go, can't say who it is, but, and then they say, I'll tell you off the air. I said, no, 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 no. I don't want you to tell me anything off the air that you can't tell the audience Good. on the air. I like that. I, I want to be the audience. So if you can tell me and the audience, great. Otherwise, don't tell me. You're right. Also, don't tell the story if you're not going to tell me who it is. Uh, that's the other thing. It's a great story. Yeah, I'm sure it's a great story, but I don't want to know the story because what makes it great for me is knowing who it happened to. You and I part on that. Sometimes I think that the story can be good enough that it's not, you can fill in the The blank whole who. time I'm listening to the story, I'm thinking, who was this? Who was this? Who was this? There's a phone right behind you, I think. Can you hand it to me, please? Who is it? <laughs> oh, my God. Mark is getting a call from a cel I can't tell you which celebrity it is, but... <laughs> Time for our weekly visit. We talk politics. We talk more. He is Michael Shore, everybody. Oh. Hey, how are you, everybody? Dick Thank Rob. you. Oh, wow. A lot of people here. More people here than usual today, Mark. This is exciting for me. I love having you on the show. And as it turns out, may only be having you on the show. This may be a show dedicated to thoughts that you have and some issues that concern the country because uh, I don't know that there'll be another guest on the show. Right. Well, that, you know, I think it speaks to my reliability. It does speak to your reliability. You're very dependable, and you're not receiving compensation for your appearance. Well, that, you know, it depends. One man's bagel and coffee is another man's compensation. <laughs> Good yeah. point. There are a couple of things that happened that you deserve credit for that I haven't been able to give you credit for on this show yet. And here's what I mean. Penicillin. You, oh. No, not any kind of real breakthrough. <laughs> but you did hint on this show at the fact that this Broidy character. Elliot Broidy, yeah who is uh, the guy who had a relationship with this Playboy playmate and then impregnated her. Right. Or the technical term, knocked her up. Right. And then asked her to get an abortion or paid for that abortion and then paid her hush money on top of that to the tune of something north of a million dollars. Yeah, 1.3 million. That this Broidy guy, who was a client of Michael Cohen, right. the fix-it guy for Donald Trump. And by the way, Michael Cohen did not have very many clients, so it's curious. That was one of the other curiosities of it. Yeah, the three big clients were Trump, Broidy, and Sean Hannity. Was he a big client or just he, a he client? Was, he, was a, he consulted him, so he, he t called him a client because they had, you know, the, uh, it was on a deal that he was retained by him, but just it was a real, like a small deal according yeah. to him. Yeah. So even if you accept, forget about Sean Hannity, Trump and Broidy were the two big clients. Anyway, I just wanted to give people some sense of the fact that Broidy and Trump are linked through Michael Cohen. Right. Broidy paid this playmate who he got pregnant. 
He paid her money to, I don't know, go away, keep quiet, whatever, right. presumably, right? But we, when, should, we should also say that Trump and Broidy are connected, too, because Broidy was the finance chairman of the Republican National Committee, too. So that, that's, how, that's what brings them together. So you suggested on this show that the Broidy connection is very possibly because Broidy is not the person who got the Playboy Playmate pregnant right. and is not really the person who's paying the hush money. On his own behalf. Correct. It's Donald Trump who very likely got the playmate pregnant and right. had this secret affair, and the hush money is really on behalf of Donald Trump. Yeah. You know, that was the first thing I thought, and that's where my mind went because of how distrustful I am of the whole setup, the, the Cohen-Donald Trump thing. I'm, I'm distrustful of the president with good reason, with nonpartisan reasons. I'm distrustful of him. And when I heard about it, it was the first place my mind went. I thought, there's no way. There's no way this is really the story. Michael Cohen's the man who said he would take a bullet for the president. It's actually, in my mind, it was, uh, I think, Elliot Broidy may be the person who took a bullet, bullet for the president. Uh, and you know, now there's reporting that supports that, or there are people. I, I don't say there's reporting that supports that. There hasn't been anything evidentiary, really. Well, there's more and more talk that this could right. be the case because right. it does appear that there were favors granted to Brody, access to Trump, even policy access to Trump, and it would it would it's suggested that it would connect to Brody having really gone the extra distance for Trump. Yeah, that's exactly right. What man would do that? A man who tells his family, I'm going to do this and, and nothing else. Um, again, until there's proof of it, but I am sort of happy. I feel like I was the first person I heard talk about it. So, and weeks later, now they're talking about it. And I'm sure there's someone out there who can say, no, no, it was here first. But I really, I, I came up with that independently. Yeah, that's what was so cool. Now, just to give people an idea of who Brody was, because I think you're going to hear more about him. He's doing business with the White House in a way that we're now seeing a lot of people doing business with the White House. A lot of, when I say people, I mean a lot of institutions, like representatives mm -hmm. of major nations, where money changes hands, and then it appears that policy changes. Brody is one of those people, too. I mean, he's bribed public officials and has served time for bribing public right. officials. Right, right. Um, he's, he's not a, a clean guy. No, he was convicted of, of bribery in yeah. 09. Right. And he has cultivated this relationship with Donald Trump, and he's cultivated this relationship, these were his relationships with the Middle Eastern countries as well. Right. And those countries seeking representation with the president. Yeah. Anyway, I just wanted to put a little check mark by Michael Shore for that prediction. Thank you for noticing. If this winds up being true, that was our first Ed Show exclusive. Yes, right. thank you. Two bagels next week. There was something else I wanted to give you credit for, and now I can't remember what it was. Telling you to bet the Yankees. Oh, my God. Against the if Yankees? You, I don't bet sports the way I used to. I used to be a frenzied sports better. And that's one of the reasons that I don't do it anymore. It's just too yeah. much of a frenzy. It's good but, that you don't do it anymore. But Michael Shore it. gives me all of these picks on hockey, on baseball. And I'm going to get to the baseball pick because I want to share it with our audience because it makes total sense. You don't need to be a gambler or a sports fan even to understand it. Yeah. But I, of course, don't really bet it, so I don't really bet in these hockey picks. All of his hockey picks come in. They don't always, I should say. They don't always come in because my guess is that probably more of them haven't. But I've been on a good run lately, and that's what happens with gambling. But And I haven't been gambling. You know, I just, right. I, I sort of look at it because I'm a hockey fan. And I was, I think I was like, you know, like 12 and 1 in the first round of the playoffs. And yeah. it, was, it was crazy. No, but listen to his sports pick related to the Yankees game. Listen to the reasoning why it makes sense. Tell everybody what you told me to do and why you told me to do it. I said last week when we recorded the podcast, I said, Mark, the Yankees were laid over in D.C. where they were rained out twice and they couldn't get any hotel rooms there. You have to remember, torrential rain that prevented air flights of all kinds. All the airports around Washington and many around the Northeast, they were shut down because of these heavy thunderstorms. And so the Yankees that, were given the option to stay, like to get onto their plane and just sleep on at the gate on their plane. Most of them said they wanted to stay in the airport. They slept in the airport, walked around the airport. There was one restaurant that was remained open there. And they were there, I mean, for hours. They couldn't take off until 3 or 4 in the morning. And they'd been there for 12 hours, something like that. So I said to Mark, I said, you know, you should bet the Royals Friday night because that's the first game. They got in on a Thursday. They had a day off at least to catch up a little bit. And they're going to play I said, the They're going to be exhausted, but they're going to play the Royals on Friday. They're going to be exhausted. You'll probably get a good price because it's the Royals, the lowly Royals against the powerhouse Yankees. And it turned out that the Yankees lost 5-2 to two or 6-2 to two that night. Because it, and it dates back, Mark, 
to, I had a friend who played in the National Hockey League. I had a, a handful of them, and one of them called me, and he knew that I dabbled in sports gambling. This was a long time ago, and it was not for very much money. And and he said to me, he said, uh, Shorzy, which was my hockey nickname, which is my favorite thing in the whole world, is that I got a hockey nickname from the NHL. He said, Shorzy, we got in at 4 in the morning. We uh, had 10 hours because of a snowstorm. We went, we had to connect to Calgary. We're going to lose tomorrow. Wow. He said it to me like that. He said, you know, he didn't say bet against them. We're going to throw the game. Anything like that. He said, there's no way we're winning tomorrow. They lost. This is a hockey game, Mark. They yeah. lost 10 nothing. Wow. And so what it shows you is that these athletes who are at the very top of their game, the, the differences are so subtle from one team to the next that any advantage, whatever that advantage is, and you know it from poker, right? When you have a good flop or a good whatever, you have to capitalize on whatever perceived percentage advantage you're going to have in poker, I would guess. So this is a great hockey team of the best 18 guys. They were on the Boston Bruins at that time. The best 18 guys to make the Bruins going to play an NHL game against Calgary, who were fantastic as well because they were the top of their game. The sleep made the difference, and they lost 10 nothing. God, that's just unreal. Yeah. yeah that, and in that Yankees example that you yeah. gave, I mean, the Yankees really are the powerhouse team. Of course. And so you'd think, well, maybe if they lose, it'll be right. by a run or something, but they lost. But to... hitters being overtired uh, in some way uh, against pitchers who are not, there's your, there's your edge. Uh, yeah. Look at that. How about that? Working yeah. the name of the show. And I'm glad you mentioned gambling, or maybe it was I who mentioned gambling. I, I don't know, but it, there's a, it's inevitable that it gets mentioned. So. But the Supreme Court ruled to legalize gambling. Yeah, sports gambling. It's going to be a state-by-state -state thing, but right. it's clearly going to, because there's just so much money here, I think the country's going to be awash in these different betting parlors, the same way you might find in Britain. Yeah. Do you agree with that? I do, and I you know, and I disagree with the legalization of it, too. I don't think the, you know, I, whenever things are legalized that are vice, the people that you think are going to benefit from them are not the ones you want to see benefit from them. So I, I don't... Well, it, well, it, uh, yeah. I happen to agree with you, and I'll give you my thought in a second, but I want to, what do you mean by the well, last I mean, thing I think it's said? going to become a corporate center for profit, and it's not going to be, you know, the, these these Won't companies tax that, money accrue from it? It, it? Tax money will accrue from it, but if tax money accrues from it, I don't see what the offset would be. You know, I don't see the benefit to if you live in, you know, Illinois, and they legalize sports gambling in Illinois. I don't know that's going to help someone downstate all of a sudden. It's going to, and but the other side of it is for people who have the sickness and the the ability to bet on sports is going to ruin so many lives with the facility that they have. At OTB in New York, right, was a it was off track betting, and you would go to these OTB parlors, and I went because I liked it. I got a fake ID to bet on horses, not to drink, and and so I I was immediately drawn to paramutual wager. And so you'd go there, but you'd see the saddest people there bringing $2 up on a show ticket and then screaming. They were always screaming. It was worse than the DMV. These people were frustrated with the people selling them the ticket or they made a mistake. Or, and and it was a really depressing place. And New York's done away with OTB. But, and was that the but, reason that they did away with no, it? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think that, first of all, they weren't the, – the, uh, it wasn't a money maker as much anymore because horse racing isn't a, a place where people go with. That's their the real money. reason, right? It, it is, you know. I think my that's point what, is, if they were making money on it, they'd, it's, they'd still well, be that's open. true. They would, but they would be. You're right. I, that's true, and they would be feeding on the fact that you know they're taking, it's, it, and it's a little different than the lottery, you know, because you you spend a day there or an afternoon, and it's bigger money, and and so I I don't like that. I don't think this country, it's 200 some odd years old, they haven't matured into how to deal with vice here. And I think that's a problem. I agree with you. And I agree with even some additional layers I'll just quickly give you. First of all, the arguments that are associated with, well, hey, look, it goes on anyway. Yeah. Why not get a piece of the tax right. money? I don't completely push back on that because, for example, with marijuana, I feel as though it does go on anyway, and there should be a reasonable legislative process by which marijuana is legal and tax money is gathered. I put marijuana in a different category because, I, I mean, I actually see it as less harmful than alcohol. But right, and I, I agree with you on that. I, the reason, I was not for the legalization of it. I was for the decriminalization of marijuana, which I think is a— the, 
there's a there's a real conversation that didn't happen very often on the on that issue. I, I'm interrupting. I mean, if it's de- no, no, but this is interesting to me. If it's decriminalized, then you're not then there is not tax money associated with it. There's not tax money associated, but the, but you also are not able to go to Seven Eleven and buy a joint, a pack of joints, and no, you're also not it. giving Philip Morris all of this money and all of these subsidies to produce because they're the ones with the machines rolling, right? And they're the ones whose tobacco cigarettes are going down, and they're the ones who I'm not saying Philip Morris specifically, but those types of companies that have the infrastructure to make mass market joints. They're the ones who are going to be the ones that profit, and I don't want to see them do well. Yeah. The profit thing, I'll put aside for a second. Yeah. As you're describing 7-Eleven with those cigarettes there that now are marijuana cigarettes and illegal, it creates scenarios by which people just do get baked and are baked all the time. And in that sense, honestly, I could see marijuana being a net negative on society. Then you go back to the Michael Shore argument at the beginning, which I haven't really addressed on the gambling issue, but I'd be happy to give you a second on it. But I think you make then that point really applies here, which is those who really have the inability to push away from marijuana and getting baked all day are going to be baked all day and they're going to be less productive and they're going to be a blight on society. I'm sure there are people listening to me right now going, what? How the hell can you say this? People should be able to get alcohol is legal and people can get drunk all day and some do, some don't. It's not like everybody walks around drunk. Alcohol is the best example for this. Alcohol, we have legalized alcohol. We should learn the lesson that we don't need to because look at the lives that are ruined from alcohol. I'm not saying it in sort of an old-fashioned, you know, you shouldn't drink and you shouldn't smoke kind of way. But I think the better example, I was going to say, alcohol isn't a blight on society of the sort that everybody's walking around like a zombie because they've got marijuana that that they can't handle. And, you know, some people can handle pot, no problem. Nobody can handle alcohol, no problem. Right, right. There's a level that anybody gets to, uh, the people who drink once or people who drink every day, you, you, they drink to get, you know, what, what, what they know where they're going to be drunk. And there's a level to which every person is going to be inebriated. And then people get into a car and they, uh, listen, I, I, again, I'm not, I have no problem with people having access to marijuana, right? I just, I, you know, I certainly think the problem with marijuana is not the drug. It's the way that people are incarcerated for moving and possessing and using small amounts of something that is essentially, I shouldn't say harmless, but is not harmful enough to warrant that. And it's it's along color lines. It's along economic strata. I think that you do have to compare the two, though. And I think that there's a that between alcohol and marijuana, I think that you have to learn a lesson from alcohol that, you know, Americans have a difficult time with alcoholism in this country. Uh, well, I'll say this. Marijuana is safer than alcohol. I'll just say that. It that- is. Fine. No, I'm not disagreeing with you, Mark. I'm not saying it's not safer. But what I'm saying is the fact that we have abused alcohol as a people for so long and has been destructive on the roadways, it's been destructive in the wallet, it's been destructive in relationships, I don't have to go through it, should make us think more than I feel we did about how we legalize something like marijuana. So I, that's why I wanted to decriminalize it more than I wanted to legalize it. I don't think that it, and again, getting it illegal, if you decriminalize it, are you endorsing the illegal sale of it and the illegal trafficking of it? Maybe, and, and my argument's imperfect, but I do think there's a that, that sensibility wasn't paid enough attention to. Let me get back to the gambling for a second, the legalized gambling. So now you're gonna have, I agree with you completely, those people who are broken, if yeah. you will, and I can say this because I'm broken with a small b, you know, like I can stop, which I have, but I love the action. And Could I know you it. never gamble again? Absolutely. Absolutely. You could never sit at a car table and never go to a betting window again. Yep. I could. I could. Again, if you took that out of the world of theory. Well, and, well you, you have to want to, first of all, too. Right. And you don't want I to. I believe like... I was gambling the most, like I used to get off the air at 1130 at night, drive to a poker game regularly, like four or five nights a week. I think because I was looking for something. I wanted a distraction. I was kind of unhappy. I was doing the same job over and over, night after night. It was not exciting to me. I think there are other things going on with that gambling addiction. I'll tell you one thing. I can't watch a lot of sports without knowing what the line is and Mm -hmm. knowing at least where the action is. That makes it interesting to me. No, no, listen. I mean, especially for a casual sports fan, if you're in Milwaukee and, oh, the Brewers are in town, it'd be fun to go to the game, but it would be if you're, if you have any kind of a Jones for gambling, it'd be nice to put a hundred bucks on the Brewers, you know, and so. so. And for most people, a hundred bucks is not going to make or break it. So I think that if you have those tendencies that could lead you down a really bad path, yeah, having gambling legal and ubiquitous now, I mean, now it will be everywhere. As you said, I love your example of OTB because I think that's what you're going to have. You're going to have these gambling parlors like Britain. Right. And they will tend to prey on 
and benefit from those that don't have a lot of money. Exactly. And you don't see a lot of winners walk out. I mean, you, with the horses, maybe you see a few more than you would with sports because there are people that can handicap the sport, the horses, and they're a very small percentage of the people that, that do it. And they're people that are usually at the track and seeing morning workouts and, and all that. Thing. But, you know, the other part of it, as I was listening to you talk about gambling, is and this, it struck a chord when you said 100 bucks isn't going to make or break. But the 100 bucks is the bet that the person who can afford to lose 50 bucks makes. Because until it's dangerous, until it's a little sexier, it's not that exciting, right? And so that's the danger with these things that are vice. And that's why people say marijuana is a gateway drug. I don't know if it is. I'm not a user of, of marijuana. But I do know from having gambled, you go up a scale of when it becomes a little dangerous. Because at 1130, when you get off the air, if you went to a, a dollar poker game, a one dollar, two dollar poker game. You're not driving there every night, I don't think. You're going because it's the action. You are bored with part of your life, and you're trying to excite the rest of it. And it's the same thing, I think, with alcohol. Is that people, you know, some people have thresholds where, yeah, two drinks. Yeah, I used to feel pretty good after two drinks, but now I need that fourth drink until I'm really feeling really good. And, and I'm sure it's that way with drugs. It's that way with a lot of things, like race cars or automobiles. Or, you know, the BMW it was a great car to me once, but now I want to get the. And so when it's dangerous. It's when it becomes interesting, and that's what you're asking people to, to get to. I think we're mixing a bunch of things here that don't necessarily, though, need to be mixed. And I'll make one overall point, and that is there are people, and maybe even I'm among them, that can do some of the things you mentioned responsibly. We don't overindulge to the point that it begins to crash and burn in other parts of our lives. But then there are other things that are less easy to control. So to wrap it all up into marijuana, gambling, alcohol, they're all the same in the sense that people can't control it and they want the danger or whatever. It, it depends, of course, on the person. Some of us who can do all of these things responsibly. And there's right. some of us who can't do any of them responsibly. Right. The thing about gambling that was interesting to me is that you're now going to hear it talked about totally. in the media, yeah. on the ball games. It's now going to be out of the shadows. And that's going to drive more action to the party, more handicappers, more. It's going to be, and believe me, because I've lived in this world, it's all crappy. It's the worst of us. Right. These edgy BS artists telling that they can get you the edge on the game and they know something you don't and pay for the information and it'll pay off. It's awful. And these businesses are a blight on media. They're just obnoxious. And it, the worst infomercials are these guys going, you know, hey, I'm, I'm Bobby the Book and I'm going to tell you how to be. You know <laughs> totally, what I mean? right. Yeah. And, and these athletes who we probably once thought of as incorruptible over the last years with steroids and all of those things, even though they knew that you could, they were testing for steroids and these guys still took them, right? Imagine, you know, how easy it would be for a middle of the road player to, you know, to, to, you know, miss a pass on purpose because he was getting 100,000 from a guy who had a million on the game. I know? think it's hard to fix NFL games because there's so many people involved, but I, I take your point very seriously. Yeah, because... That's a, may, maybe a feeble example, but there are, there are ways of a goaltender, a, uh, you know, a pitcher. As, a, as you know, know, we're in, yeah, pitcher easily. Tennis, as you know, had yeah, a, sort of still sure. has a yeah. lot of question marks on it because that's a game in which there's only one guy. You got to get to right, <laughs> and and there is no sort of second guessing someone who retires because of an injury in a match, right? Exactly. The other Supreme Court ruling was I felt very important. It was a ruling regarding your ability as a an employee get together with other employees and file a class action suit for various right. things. It might be a, a wage issue. It might be. A, uh, treatment in the workplace. It might be any number of things that might come up as an employee. Now the Supreme Court is saying it is uh, not legal now to get together with other employees. To and, file a class action. And so, file a yeah. class action. That's a Gorsuch ruling, too. He wrote the ruling on that as his first, I think it was his first ruling that he had written. Uh, I it's, think that's it's, incredibly it's dangerous. Damaging. Yeah, it's yeah. terribly damaging. And it, you know, again, it. we just had an election where all they talked about was inequality, right? Income inequality, social inequality, not being able to work your way up. The people at the top have everything and they'll get all the benefits and the people at the bottom don't. And we need to be aware of that. We need to fix it. And this goes right in the face of that. And this speaks against the smaller person. I don't mean that the people are, but you no, know, those without power, those without power, the powerless have no voice. There's and, and, um, 
it's it's really tough, and it, you know, and it makes being a whistleblower harder too. And uh, we have, yeah, and it's rules. already harder now to be a, exactly. to be a whistleblower. Exactly. You know, there used to be uh, rewards for being a whistleblower. Right. Now we call them informants. We right. even change what we call them. The thing, also, I'll remind everyone is that your power as an employee is a powerless one versus yeah. this corporation it comes in numbers. You need these other employees to help put a coalition together, Completely. so that you're able to mount a legal case. Oftentimes, if you just pencil it out, if you're just an individual employee, there's no economic incentive for a lawyer to take the case. Correct. I mean, That's exactly right. So the only way it makes economic sense is yeah. to put yourself together with the rest of this class and file a class action. Right. I was really disturbed by this, and I think it, as you correctly identify, it is one more nail in the coffin of those without power, of, right. of the workers and employees of America. And, and what people really need to do is step back, like you're saying, and look at the macro effect that these small things have. So if you just look at it as a Supreme Court case, you look at the legality of it, and you say, well, okay, he, he ruled this way, she went that way. Uh, yeah, it's pretty bad. But if you step back and you think, it's not just that. it's it, This is a, an endorsement stamp on something that has been happening in America for years now, where people are becoming less and less powerful. And that's bad. Yeah. I think it is a more divided court than ever. And I'm not a historian on the Supreme Court, but in other words, the rulings are predictable along party lines. They are. And, you know, and I, I feel I'm not a historian on it either. And I feel like I've watched the hearings of all the modern day, probably this entire Supreme Court. I remember Kennedy's hearings. And where you are now is that it's so public and there's it's so covered that it can't help but be more political and more divided. There, it, it did not that it was always cloak and dagger. But it was a foregone conclusion. And then you had justices who would change over time, as you've seen with, you know, you saw it with David Souter, who, but mostly you, you saw it with John Paul Stevens, named by Ford. A lot of people thought he would be much more conservative than he was. And so you, there were surprises. You don't get that very often. John Roberts is, you know, like an 8% surprise, but not big. I think you make a really good point about the media because the media coverage does leave the justices a little less wiggle room. Because right. it's just that they're under such scrutiny and, and they're excoriated if they come up with a ruling that their party and the party that was responsible for their appointment doesn't like. And we're sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't here, because I like I don't think that they should be apolitical. In fact, I think it's the most important thing you're voting for with a president is the only thing that cannot be changed from their legacy. I mean, Donald Trump can do all that he wants to every little thing that uh, Barack Obama did, whatever childish ways he wants to do it, and whatever adult and presidential ways he wants to do it. He could do it all. So he can't take Sonia Sotomayor. He can't take Elena Kagan. He can't do those things and change the Supreme Court. The Republican Party knew that quite clearly, and that's why they didn't vote on Merrick Garland. They left that seat vacant, right. and many people voted and are getting what they wanted. Yeah, we wanted a conservative justice. We wanted rulings like this one, and we're going to take on Roe v. Wade, which I never thought would right. be presented before the court again. I think this is the centerpiece for many people of this yeah. past election. I know i got to let you go, and I want to thank you for being here. Is there anything else? Watch these Stanley Cup finals. Bet on them! <laughs> Michael Shore, Everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks. thanks to my boyfriend, Sam Rubin, and thanks to my other boyfriend, Michael Shore, for making it by today. And thank you, all my boys and girlfriends, all my brothers and sisters. Thank you for hanging out with me. Until next time, bye-bye. Hey, everybody, why don't you do me a favor and like the ads with Mark Thompson on Facebook? Yeah, that's going to bring in the kids. Hi, it's Robin Super here. Listen to past episodes and subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher to get future episodes. Or check out their website, edge-show.com. Edge-show.com.